Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good following morning. This is AMA number 68. 68, the post Yom Kippur AMA. Today is September 17th, 17th, 2021. I'm here with my new co host, Rabbi Avi Baumel. Today, Shalom to all. An amazing, amazing guest, Rabbi Batya Jacobs, good friend of ours, uh, lives in Efrat, uh, where Avi is. And uh, yeah, so I will be outnumbered. One rabbi, one rabbi, and one atheist today on the show. So it should get, should get interesting. Uh, rabbi Avi, how is your Yom Kippur? I tell you, my Yom Kippur, though not in the Isaac Shul, as has been in years past, was nevertheless beautiful. I was in the hills of Efrat. Um, it was actually, I, I participated in an outside minion. So there were three buildings and we were in the parking lot in between all of them. And it was amazing to see everyone was kind of joining and participating from all different sides and everyone was able to be there and the kids were playing in the park. And uh, we were just doing it. It was a more kind of like a grassroots organic type of thing instead of like in the synagogue and, and yet sat in a specific place. We were all kind of moving around. Um, it was quite beautiful. How about you? That's very nice to hear. A little back to nature, uh, back to nature for you. Well, if a parking, parking lot is sort of our version of nature, but okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, there's a, you know, at Ne'ila, uh, I'm sure you were there at Ne'ila, Jonathan. Sure. Yeah, at Ne'ila, there's a beautiful uh, uh, sentence that we say, we say, uh, the, the sun is setting, the day is closing, and now we're going to, the, the, the doors are, uh, are, are about to be locked, right? And I was looking out and I looked over the mountains of Judah and I saw the sun setting and everything was turning red and the, the darkness of the night was coming. You really felt like uh, uplifted that you really have last moments to, to, to think about your year and to pray for a, you know, a, a year to come. So it was very moving. Um, I am very familiar with Neela, thank you. Uh, but I, I, uh, I may have missed it this year. I did go, uh, so for us, we were, uh, as people may know, the Isaac Synagogue was closed uh, to, to the community for davening. There's a very small space that is left and it wasn't big enough for Rosh Hashanah. It's like almost a hallway where the normal davening is and that was uh, insufficient. So for Rosh Hashanah, we were all davening and you were here with us. We were davening in a hotel behind, uh, behind the JCC. Uh, but that was unavailable. So we, the JCC, offered space to Chabad, which is really not only Chabad, it's for most of the Jews in Krakow, I would say, uh, to, in, in this extra space that we have a few blocks away that we use as a classroom, uh, which we, on, on uh, Stradomska Street. So we were, we were davening there. And it was interesting because it's right next to a, an Indian restaurant and you sort of have to go through an alley and Certain, at a certain point, I was like, oh, this is so strange. Instead of the synagogue that we're davening in this like little, you know, place that's a, this classroom that's in a building, this old building. And then I, had, I realized that the exact opposite was the case, that in some ways, this was the real return uh, to what it was like pre-war, that in pre-war Krakow, you know, you had the civic, uh, you know, you had some synagogues, but you had a hundred different little shtibles, little prayer halls, and somebody in his basement, and somebody in this half of his apartment, and this room, and that they were davening, and and that was exactly what it was like. And uh, at a certain point, the owner of the building, we know the owners, and that's why we rent from there. So the owner of the building, who's this lovely woman, she's very involved in. Uh, Christian Jewish uh, dialogue in our organization here that we have in Krakow. That's how I know her. And she came into the building and she was so happy. I told her before that, that we were davening there for Yom Kippur and she was, she was really very moved. And I said, oh, you know, what, a, what an amazing thing that we're, that we're able to pray here and thank you for making this space uh, available to us. And she said, oh, you know, that before the war, and she pointed a few feet to the apartment, sort of the next one, the next space next to us is, oh, that was a uh, there was like a little shtibel there uh, before the war, wow. which was like in the next space. So I thought, you know what? Maybe it's not so strange of, that the Jews in Krakow are praying in a small little, uh, this little space. On some level, it is, of course, uh, you know, a, a tragedy that there are all these available synagogues and we were, we were praying only in this, uh, this space there. But on some level, there was a certain, certain poetry and a certain full circle-ness uh, to it. Yeah, the, the, the Talmud has stories of uh, the rabbis praying in a, a, a destruction area, in a, in a cave, and 
And they, they ask about it, and the, and, and the rabbis say, Rahmana liba bai. God just wants our hearts. You know, he wants us to, to pour out our hearts and a big structure, even though rightfully and justfully, we should be able to access it in the, as a Jewish community. But anywhere we are that we can call out to God is, uh, is a win. So uh, I'm glad and for that me, any place, you know, I guess for me, it's more any place that we can be together as a community and, and follow our traditions and, and you know, and, and our culture is, is a win. I also but it's also I think for most Jews, I don't know, for me, if I'm in a really big synagogue, you know, really grand. And I mean, these like amazing ones, uh, you know, Temple Emmanuel or great synagogue in, in, in Jerusalem, they don't feel, you know, to me, a, there's something a little goyish about it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want my synagogue to remind me of. St. Peter's. I think that churches and cathedrals, maybe cathedrals more in that sense, had, you know, a different message, a different, a different purpose, really, almost, uh, you know, not to oversimplify, but almost, almost of, uh, you know, of intimidation uh, and, 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 and stuff in a way that I don't think synagogues were ever really designed to do. Yeah, there's, a, there's an intimacy that, you know, and everyone's kind of calling out and screaming out and, and praying on their own and doing it in their own way. You know, it's very disorderly, but beautiful in, in, that, in that aspect. So, yeah, you're right. When uh, it, there's a very big contrast to how things are done in other religions uh, and it makes it, uh, makes it more personable. Yeah. Uh, take a moment to say uh, hi to Saul in Seacliff. Hey, Saul Schachter. You know, Saul and I were supposed to meet and uh, he was on his way to meet me in New York. And then the hurricane came and my flight was, I had to come to New York the next day and I missed Saul. So sorry about that, Saul, but good to always see you here. And we'll, we'll meet in person, Saul, don't worry. And hi, Sita, my dad is watching. Uh, hi, dad, hope you had a good uh, Yom Kippur and you uh, were safe. I know you wanted to go to synagogue, not sure how that turned out, but- Jerry, uh, you should know that your son not only was Osek the Tsar Sibor that he helped to make sure that there was a minion in Krakow, but he went to the shul and he participated in the shul. Nachis all around, Jerry. Not only, if we're already going down that path, and thank you, Avi, I had an aliyah on, uh, oh, on Yom oh. I usually try to avoid uh, having an aliyah. I don't feel, no, honestly, not to make light of it, I don't. I don't feel comfortable having an aliyah when women aren't uh, aren't allowed to participate in that in that way. But sometimes it's not so easy to say no. And uh, for the sake of the community and and to show show what I wanted to do, I, I I did have an aliyah and it was very nice. And I was wearing my but I was wearing and this is probably a first in the Chabad thing. I was wearing my Women of the Wall talis uh, that Kasha got me for my birthday. So I was in my very colorful talis as I had my had my aliyah. Well, don't worry. That will segue nicely into our uh, our guest this uh, this class. This uh, well, how was your how was your fast and your break fast, Avi? Um, fasting is fine for me, um, as my mother likes to say. I have a lot of reserves, so thanks, Michelle. And um, and the break fast was fun. Actually, we had a lot of members of the family here, so. It was uh, chaotic and fun and joyful, and uh, um, we ate too much, and then we all got sick. It, it, you know, classic Jewish uh, breakfast. No complaints. So usually I, I break the fast with pizza. It was tradition for us in Krakow that a few of us, Ellen Germain, Pani Consul, and Aditta, a bunch of us would always go. But I don't know, this year, I guess with Corona, also we'd eaten, Kasha and I had eaten pizza a few days before, so we didn't. We didn't uh, go to the usual pizza pizza breakfast and just just uh, ate at home, which was also very nice and had some soup and uh, nothing kind of leftovers and uh, stuff. But when you're living with a chef, then the leftovers are still not too bad. So that's uh, that's kind of where we are. Hey, Sue Ellen, I see Sue Ellen is writing. Happy New Year. Shana Tova to you, Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen. Oh, you and all the K-Dai. We miss the K-Dai. I, do. Su I hear Sue Ellen. I think about the ride. We we do miss we do miss the Kedai, and we will. I'm sure we will see some of us will see some of the Kedai soon. But, my sister uh, just texted me, Daniela in Atlanta. She's watching us live. Shout out to my sister Shana Tova. We love you. Hey Daniela, Shana Tova. Hope to see you soon. Hope all is well in Atlanta. Oh, there we go. Now I see her on Facebook. Um, so Sukkot coming up Monday night, we have Sukkot. I have to tell you that the, what, there are a few holidays where I'm so mindful of the fact that 
those holidays weren't created slash invented slash however given to us however we want to see it in Poland but in Israel uh, when we have uh, Tu Bishvat I'm always very mindful of the sort of disconnect in the middle of the winter digging the snow out uh, for the trees and Sukkot when we have to sit and freeze in the sukkah I'm very mindful of, uh, of, of the fact of how sort of this disconnect between this idea that Judaism was a local Judaism was something local that became uh, international. Hey, that's just the whole idea about Sukkot, you know, that, you know, you got to brave it outside a little bit and have a little faith that uh, you'll be taken care of. So uh, it, to do it in the summer, that's no, uh, no brilliance, right? Wait, wait a minute. But excuse me, the uh, September this year, it's early, fine. But September, October in Poland is not okay. September, October in, uh, in Jerusalem. Fair enough. Fair enough. I have to say goodbye to my son who is leaving and I won't see him for Yantu. I'm going to give him a kiss. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom. Very professional, Avi. We'll, we'll, hey, we'll hey, discuss that. Is, we'll discuss yeah, that anything can happen. Now. Anything can happen on the AMA. Sure, the Bamel residence is wild. You never know what's going on. So we built you would not believe what's happening. Beautiful. Have you built your sukkah yet, Rabbi Avi? My sukkah is in Kesaria, and it is uh, in the in the in the process of being built. It's quite a beautiful. It over it uh, looks out to the pool. the pool over the pool. Yes. 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 Can you swim? I want a question. Halakhically, can part of the sukkah be over water, and you can swim and be in the sukkah at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? I I like that idea. Okay. Sukkah sukkah in water. You know. So as. So 30 seconds after Rabbi Avi told me about suffering in the cold of the sukkah, he let us know <laughs> that his sukkah will be by the swimming pool in Kisaria. It's a good Thanks reason to move to Israel. <laughs> this is a good idea for Aliyah. Uh, but we built a sukkah as we always were very proud of our JCC sukkah. We don't go in for any of that plastic wrap and, and prefabricated. We do it all natural. We get our palm fronds from the uh from the botanical garden and build i think a truly beautiful sukkah every year yeah i love building the sukkah i'm usually there knocking away uh this year uh i'll come in a little late uh, i'm sure it's up and looking good or, or getting there it's looking very very good and uh we will take our traditional sukkot photo at the entrance avi as we do it's amazing every year and we don't look older we look, uh, we look older and wider. That's okay. Did you say wiser or wider? What do you think I said? <laughs> I, we, we may be older and wiser, but we look older and wider. Okay. Okay, you'll you'll no no comment on that one. So no excited. So you're coming, but you're coming back to uh, you're coming back to us on Sunday. Of course. Wouldn't miss sukkahs. And how we had a lot you... of fun in that sukkah. We pile people in there and we sing and we eat, eat uh, challah and honey and uh, have a wonderful meal. It's great. It's supposed to be about uh, 13 degrees or so something, probably like 45 degrees and rainy Monday night. So it might be more of a kiddush in the sukkah. And then we run inside to the warmth of the JCC. Oh, come on. Let's. Yeah, I hear you. We've got a community that. Uh, needs to deal with it in the best way possible. Yeah, we need to uh, be mindful. We've been, we've done a good job, I think, knock on wood, taking care of our seniors, not uh, making sure that they all get through Corona and we don't want to get anybody catching like a, you know, a Kremlin cold in the sukkah, something like that, God forbid. All right, but maybe there will be a, a little sukkah's miracle that, that it, the weather there will might, change. There might be. Here is Bria Shabbat from you and your dad in Balaton. Hello, Bria. And Bria Paley and Michael Paley, who I just saw at the Shabbaton here in Krakow, his wonderful uh, Tarbut building lay leadership in Central Europe, in Warsaw, and a little bit of Krakow and in Budapest. It's uh, He's, uh, think about this, you have a rabbi, an incredibly influential, successful, important American rabbi, one of the most knowledgeable people around, and he retires from UJA, and he picks up and he moves to Budapest to build Jewish life in Central Europe, a beautiful thing. I Hello, participated in, and I thought it was fascinating that uh, idea of building uh, building lay leadership and they were all engaged and the, it was and you gave a wonderful right. presentation. Very cool. Uh, so well, and is everybody uh, did you, Avi, did you know Alex got so one of the one of the, the Alex Cadis 
one of the Kedai got engaged to Emily. Kedai wedding next year. We're all very excited. Wow. So Shaka. Mazel Tov, Sue Ellen and the Kedai. And Meirav, my friend Meirav, my, my good friend, my sister on the kibbutz, Meirav. Shabbat Shalom. Miss you too, Meirav. Miss you, miss Yot Fatah, and miss Israel. It's been a year and a half. A year and a half I haven't been back since March 2020. Hopefully get back soon. But it is that time. We are very excited to be able to welcome our special, special guest, really a wonderful, wonderful person, a, a great Jewish leader, uh, Rabbi Batya Jacobs. She studied history and Judaic studies at Hebrew University. She has a master's degree in Jewish education. She began teaching Olim during her service in the education corps of the IVS uh, and became and went on to produce educational programs in the division of Torah culture of the Ministry of, of Education. At YTA, Rabbi Bacha teaches Rabbi Bacha teaches history and civics. She stands in solidarity with Reform and conservative Jews and is on the list of Orthodox rabbis who have come out in opposition to the practice of chicken kaporis. Very, we're very happy to hear it. Uh, I'm sure I am as a longtime vegetarian and Avi uh, as a somewhat vegetarian. So <laughs> welcome right before Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to our good friend, Rabbi Bacha. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Avi. Hi, Bacha. By the way, get me on that list against chicken kaparas. I'm, I'm signing right now. So uh, oh, I'm okay. on that. <laughs> uh, okay. It's good. It's you know, Isaac, Isaac Beshevis Zinger was a longtime vegetarian. And when they asked him, he says, yeah, oh, is it for health? He goes, I, didn't, I don't do it for my health. I do it for the health of the chickens. Very true. How, is How your are you? We are well, we're well. Very excited to have you. Thank you for finding the time. Well, I'm here in Tel Aviv, actually, as you see. Uh, I'm right here, having a wonderful, wonderful weekend with children who've moved to the center of the country. And over the summer, I've been spending more time in this, in this part and literally falling in love with Tel Aviv. Well, you don't have to you don't have to twist my arm. I am a big fan of Tel Aviv, although when I did after I left the kibbutz, I did choose with some friends when I made Aliyah before I made Aliyah to live in Israel. And we all chose to live in Jerusalem. But these days I <laughs> know that when I come to Israel, Kasha and I are pretty much as every second we can in Tel Aviv or, or hey, Yosef, Bacha. Bacha, and those course, are fighting Efrat. words from a fellow Ephrat, Ephratite, you know, can you imagine I <laughs> never thought it would happen. I've been, I've been living in Efrat for uh, about 36 years, and my family was also in, well, my immediate family, we all live in Efrat. Uh, my kids have been in the Yerushalayim, Efrat and Yerushalayim area, uh, abroad for a bit of time and back in Israel up north. Uh, and recently, two of our children and their young families moved to the central part of the country. So this summer, I helped them move in. Eddie and I both helped them move in. Move in. But when Eddie traveled to the States, as far as I got was traveling to Tel Aviv. <laughs> and it's, it's delightful here. It's almost like going abroad which you know has its advantages when when you live in uh jerusalem and its whereabouts and i'm so proud to be living in the judean hills and i love it uh but there's something about going to tel aviv that is like a you know uh, a little more freedom uh, a little less tension uh, just driving on that number one highway and continuing to the Ayalon and the skyline of Tel Aviv opens up. It's a little reminiscent of the Manhattan skyline that I grew up with. And, and it's a beach and it's ours. And it's, and it's great. You've just made uh, everybody watching and everybody who will watch very, very uh, jealous and uh, 
to desirous of, of going to Tel Aviv, especially those of us who don't live there and who aren't in Israel and who travel there regularly, but not during this Corona period. Uh, it's, uh, you've, you've painted a beautiful picture and there's something very special, very special in Tel Aviv. It, it's without, it, it's much more inter- relaxed, I think, than, than mm-hmm. other places. Certainly Jerusalem, you kind of feel this, the, the, you feel the weight of the history and in Tel Aviv, it's, it's besides the beach and the sun and all of that, you're, it's a lighter feeling. Definitely, definitely. And I took my granddaughter on a walk. You know, we we pass Joshua, Joshua Ben Nun Street, <laughs> the leader who led us into Israel after 40 years of wandering in the desert. And a block later, we're on Diesengaf Street, you know, wow. named after the first mayor of Tel Aviv. It's very exciting. It really is. So you've, uh, you, you know, but you, uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I were very excited to talk to you about sort of what, what you're, what you're doing now and, and, uh, and the idea, you know, this idea of, uh, of you know, Orthodox women's uh, rabbinic leadership, but maybe start a little bit, go back a little to sort of see how, how you, how you got to this place, how you became who you are. So growing up, growing up <laughs> in New York in a very particular household uh and and then making maybe making the move then to israel uh uh, with uh, you know 30 36 years ago can you maybe talk a little bit about um your childhood the idea of in other words what was there an idea i I can't imagine there was an idea of you becoming a rabbi rabbi when you were a child because that didn't exactly exist although you were living in a place that is with considering your father and his views on these things that did make it possible so you were sort of you know what i'm saying it was it, it wasn't was it couldn't have been exactly in your mind but your path as a child sort of has 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 led to this in maybe more direct way than others would have been uh if that makes yeah sense. i really had not <laughs> I hadn't thought of uh, the specific, let's say, professional direction of uh, of rabbinics until about seven, eight years ago. Um, But I did grow up together with uh, the community that my father and I would say more correctly, my parents together built on the west side of Manhattan. And uh, let me interrupt you. Uh, yes. We don't know who your father is. I mean, I we do, but not everyone on the call might be. So maybe just introduce him. So my parents are Vicky and Rabbi Shlomo Ruskin. And they, they began their rabbinic career in Manhattan on the West Side uh, about 58 years ago. Yeah, 57, 58 years ago, uh, shortly after I was born. And I really grew together with the community. There really wasn't much of uh, an Orthodox scene on the West Side. And my parents built a, wow, an extraordinary community around Lincoln Square Synagogue. And I literally grew up in the shul. It was my second home. In fact, it began in a small apartment that was on the first floor of Lincoln Towers of the apartment building where we we lived. We were on the second floor. Uh, There was a small minion and then it grew to be the community with the reputation and uh, attracting many, many uh, families, singles, uh, adult education programs, beginner services. And when I when I was a child, so I was one of the very few small children. Like literally, grew up together with the community. Uh, I was very fortunate to have grown up in a home of Torah, uh, living Torah, and Torah of uh, chesed, human compassion. My parents were both totally 
dedicated to the community. And uh, that's how I grew up. I believe that my bat mitzvah when I turned 12 was the first official bat mitzvah celebration uh, in, the, in the shul. I studied the six books of the Mishnah together with my father. We made a siyum. Wow. And, and yeah, and, uh, and we had a party for the whole shul. Everything we did in our family was with the whole shul, <laughs> including each of our weddings. Uh, it, actually, each of our weddings was with, with the Efrat community at the time as a group. Yeah. And were you Impressive. growing up, growing up, uh, uh, growing up with the community, and now doing doing what you're doing, and in your position of uh, of rabbinic leadership, was it was there an, was it something that you felt? I'm always interested in this line, and and um, something that's that's this line that's always moving. But in terms of the idea of participation of women's participation in the Orthodox world of that something that's that's is that something that that you were comfortable with is it something that you thought about was it something that was discussed very much at home this idea of of sort of moving toward uh, this just is a discussion I have with Avi very often just uh, about these things that that sometimes seem to me as a uh, like almost a conflict in, in or, 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 or a bit of a rift in, in Orthodox Judaism or modern Orthodox Judaism in terms of women's participation. Is it something that you remember thinking, oh, this is something that is okay or that should change or that just seems it is changing and Judaism has its natural flow or natural, natural uh, path that it goes on? Well, I wanna, before you answer, I wanna say, Jonathan, for over 40 years ago in New York, to have a bat mitzvah, fine, people have bat mitzvah. To finish the six sets of the Mishnah, no one did that. I've never heard of such a thing. I mean, my, I did it with my kids, but that's after 20, 30 years. For, at, that itself is a statement. You understand? Like that was, that was Rabbi Riskin you know, at his day saying, this is where we're going. So I feel like even that simple idea was the beginnings of what was going to become. So maybe my question more, were you aware of sort of being on the cutting edge that that was something that wasn't done? And have you sort of been riding this, this edge of, of things because of, of the background that you're coming from and the community that, that you come from? In many ways, uh, Torah education was so natural to me. And I never really felt like I had less opportunity. Uh, you know, perhaps we can even go back to Krakow, to Sarah Schneer, right, who was the forerunner of Torah education for women. And certainly it was embraced in my home. And we had a large library in the house and also in the show where I spent a lot of time. And I would ask questions and my father would always take out some books and we would learn together. And then the answer would evolve in that way. In other words, I was always encouraged to learn the sources and then formulate my own answer. So that was, that was very natural. Uh, in high school as well, I learned Talmud. And uh, I believe that the education that I received, the Jewish education and Torah education that I received was definitely on par with, uh, you know, with, with, with boys and men. I went to an Or Torah high school in Riverdale in New York. And there were two schools for men and women. And we learned, we learned Gemara, we learned Talmud. So uh, I, you know, I never felt uh, less than. Mm. I also pursued the Zionist dream that was part of my home. And as my parents were moving closer towards Aliyah and uh, the vision of Efrat was, uh, it began as a map in our, on our kitchen wall 
you know, just the topography of the hills of Efrat. And my father would talk about uh, the dream of Efrat and the seven hills, and it was all in the planning. Uh, I decided when I was, uh, I decided when I was about 14 that as soon as I would graduate high school, I would make Aliyah. My parents were kind of sure I would just go with them, but they weren't quite ready to leave Manhattan yet. And I said, this is it. I, uh, I studied in Jerusalem, worked on a kibbutz, and then joined the army. And again, it was just natural to me to, I guess, follow, uh, you know, follow certainly a, a vision that I was raised in, you know, that permeated my home, my home life, but that I could basically, you know, do what I wanted and I wasn't held back. Wow, Bacha, I, I, uh, this is news to me. I always, you know, everyone knew Rabbi Riskin. He was a trailblazer. He picked up and he moved to Israel and everyone followed him. And now, what I know now is, heck, he was actually following you. Well, not exactly, but uh, he says that too. <laughs> he says that, but I give, you know, I give him, my parents, the credit for being raised the way I was. That's so fun. it, so these things really came naturally to me, but I started in education and from my army service and the IDF, you know, Avi, I don't know, Avi and uh, Jonathan, I don't know how you got all this information. I heard the end of the introduction. I don't know how you got all this information about me, but um, in any case, I- We asked I, your parents. What? We asked your parents. You asked my parents, really? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I, I guess it's accurate more or less, uh, but <laughs> I've been teaching- for? We're going for more accurate, more or less is our, that's our, uh, our slogan. So I've been teaching and uh, teaching Olim, initially Olim from Ethiopia. And in the past uh, 10 years, focusing on Olim from uh, not just, not, not just the United States and Anglo speakers, but also uh, quite a number of Olim from Europe, South Africa, Poland, actually, I have a student from Warsaw wow. who made Aliyah. Uh, in any case, as far as as far as uh, pursuing, let's say, a rabbinic career, I realized about uh, seven eight years ago that I. I want to be actively involved in the process of moving Jewish law and practice forward. And to do that, it really requires a more advanced uh, halachic education, more rigorous. And, you know, halacha, the word for Jewish law, Jewish practice is halacha which literally means uh, to walk. Yeah. And it's a verb and it's to move forward because that's the nature of our, of our tradition. It's built into the system that Jewish law and practice should, should move forward as, as we develop, as there, uh, there are, new understandings and uh, we want to strengthen those those understandings that we that we have the knowledge uh, appreciation for uh, for moving towards greater uh, human rights human equality human dignity that's where we should be going and Halakha, in my mind, was, you know, it moves a little too fast for some and a little too slow for some. <laughs> and in my mind, it was moving a little too slow when it came to particularly to women's issues. So I decided that, you know, if, uh, if I want to take some, some responsibility, I should to move it forward. 
And so I joined the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Herzl Hefter, who is a neighbor in Efrat, a neighbor of ours. And he was, was forming a study program towards rabbinics in Jerusalem, uh, egalitarian. It's actually the first egalitarian Orthodox rabbinic seminary. Men and women studying together in, in the uh, study hall in the Beit Midrash. And it was very exciting. I want you to know that uh, Rabbi Herzl Hefter was my teacher in Smicha for many, many years ago. Mm, I, I didn't him. know. I held him in, I hold him in great esteem. Um, and at the same time, he is, he is certainly a revolutionary in the Orthodox world. He, he leapt, right? And uh, the, the major kind of regular Orthodox rabbi uh, community uh, saw it as him going way beyond. So you felt that you needed to take that step to go beyond because there's something that's not moving fast enough. Can we dive in a little bit to try to answer what exactly do you see that's out there today that's not moving fast enough that should be going in a better, in a, in a faster direction towards equality? Because are there gonna be any red lines? Or are, you, are you gonna just, do you wanna go all the way? Like how far are you, are we going to take this? That's 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 a hard one. It's a hard one. It's a hard question to answer. Uh, change is slow, and you know, so, uh, if if we try too quickly to to push forward, often uh, it doesn't kind of happen as naturally as it should. Uh, so I, I think though we're moving ahead very, very well. There is so much uh, Torah scholarship among women today and particularly in Israel. And as women are, are, are learning more thoroughly and intensely the, the practical laws and incorporating in practical Jewish law, uh, new developments, research, uh, scientific evidence, even medical evidence. You know, there, there is so much that we've come a long way in many, many areas. And, and and, and I believe that they should be applied as well in Jewish law, not just in laws pertaining to uh, women per se in general, but specifically pertaining to women. Of course, it's, you know, close, close to my heart. And uh, most of the questions that I get are issues that pertain to women specifically. And, and, and I think that there is definitely more room and we should be making more room for women's participation and involvement in uh, also in public, public uh, community Jewish life and also issues that pertain to family life. We have, uh, we have a ways we're moving in a, in a good direction, and I hope that we can move further we, to, to encourage more, uh, more equality and also to incorporate our knowledge in practice. That's beautiful, uh, I, and uh, I, I look just, forward to it. Sorry, can I just wanted to maybe ask, is, is the goal more equality or is the goal equality? Do you see the goal, uh, you know, I... As somebody who's coming from a sort of more of an outside point of view of not being, I, I would, can, you know, someone who's coming from a secular background that, that grew up Orthodox, but never felt really a place in it. Um, there are certain things to me that I, as a man, always have, uh, have, have, have an issue with the idea, just the lack of um, full participation or the ability of women to fully participate. If I go into an Orthodox synagogue, I'm, I feel 
I feel like I'm the person at the front of the bus in the 1950s in the United States that as a man who I don't necessarily even believe or any, doesn't matter what I know or anything, but I'm the one who's given an aliyah and counted in a minion. And, and those are things to me that are, are, are troubling. Is that, is, that a, is that a discussion that's going on a lot in terms of, of where, wh wh where you are, or is that something that is sort of not, not seen as something that's way off or, or, or just how does that fit into this? It really depends. You know, the Orthodox community is so diverse, not to mention all the other, you know, communities and uh, religious life in Israel uh, in general has become more and more diverse. And it, I think that's a very positive sign. And there are so many variations of the theme, you know, rooted in uh, a real appreciation for tradition, but yet uh, understanding that uh, we need to make more room for women in public communal life. So depending on the communities, even in Efrat, it's, in Efrat we have so many different variations, right, Avi? I mean, so it's so interesting. Uh, even, even within the same neighborhood, we'll have different synagogues with, with different styles. You have women on the balcony, women uh, behind the partition. You know, I very much identify with what you're saying, Jonathan. When I walk into a shul and I'm sitting behind a machitza, I feel like Rosa Parks and I just want to, <laughs> I just, you know, it, it just never fails. I just, you know, want to uh, move up to the front. At the same time, I, I appreciate that uh, for the most part in the Orthodox world, it's really the men who are uh, committed to maintaining the daily minyan, the daily Torah reading. You know, this requires a lot of commitment and, and a, a lot of practice, uh, a lot of learning, uh, and only in communities where women also are willing to make those commitments do we see real egalitarian minyani. There are some, but it, it's going to take some more time. And, you know, I also appreciate the different roles. I think, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, now more and more families like, you know, my children, have, have divided their roles between home and work life and communal life more, more evenly. You know, that's the direction we're going in. In religious circles, I think many, many communities still have a more traditional outlook and the men are still running the service and we, we need to keep running those daily services. So, uh, you know, that right away kind of uh, maintains a lot of the, the public service in, in the hands of the men. Uh, however, women are taking on more and more roles. In fact, what we began in our community with my daughter's bat mitzvah, uh, wow, it was a long time ago. She, she had her bat mitzvah on Sukkot, so before Sukkot. So towards Simcha Torah, when we finish reading the five books and then start from the beginning, uh, Breshit, Genesis, uh, she actually learned the reading of Vizot Bracha. This is the final blessing. She learned the Torah reading and we set up our own women's reading of the Torah. It was in our living room, which is right across the road from the synagogue. My whole family participated. Uh, she was called to the Torah and all the women were called to the Torah. And we continue this tradition in our shul every Simchat Torah. It's fascinating. Uh, uh, you, there's a there's an interesting uh, uh, 
divide that takes that's taken place over the years with regard to Rabbah and with regard to the advancement of women's roles in that in Israel, it seems to have been accepted more or less by the modern Orthodox world. Like no one's protesting, you know, there's a, a new Rabbah in Efrat who's yes. in charge of a synagogue. And there's uh, Rabbahs who are, are and, and women who are answering Jewish law and people are, are okay with it. Whereas in America, it's like they're circling the wagons the major institutions putting out proclamations. They're saying this is like the beginning of the end. It's much, much more heated and politicized in America than it, than it is in Israel. Do you feel that? Uh, I guess I'm not, I, I'm not really so much in touch with the rabbinic organizations in America. Uh, although I do know that there are Orthodox women who are serving in communal positions in America. And in Israel, you know, formally, in general, formal community roles, uh, you know, rabbinic roles is, uh, is not as prevalent because, because of the way our religious life is structured and, and politicized in its own way, which <laughs> needs some revamping, as you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know, I think there, there are, I hope that there are more and more opportunities for uh, rabbinic teaching and guidance by women in both in Israel and in the United States and in Europe throughout the world. It's, it's really critical. Rabbi Bacha, where, where, what do you want your granddaughter to, what, her, what, what Judaism or what kind of roles do you think that in 20 years there should be for women? Where do you think, see the line shifting you know, down the road? Wow, that's a hard question. Uh, I, it's so hard to tell. I don't know. You know, on the one hand, my my grandchildren are growing up uh, in a in a world where they do see more equality. Uh, even though in Orthodox religious life, I think the roles, uh, you know, communal life is is still pretty pretty divided. Uh, you know, with, with the mechitza, a clear mechitza, a clear partition running through the center of the synagogue, whether it's, you know, uh, perpendicular or horizontal, I think it's there. Um, in general, I see, I see that in the future in Israel, a larger traditional community and more egalitarian. I do. Yeah, we, we talk about this a lot, that in Israel in particular, that there's, you know, everyone talks about secular, but in terms of traditional, but follow the holidays in general and appreciate Shabbat and respect certain things, that's a huge number. And we're trying to tap into that, you know, major number and not to get too extreme. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I, I, there's definitely so much Judaism in the culture. You know, Israeli culture is so Jewish. And, uh, you know, children growing up in, quote, secular homes still get so much Judaism just by growing up in Israel. And I think there, there are so many more programs uh, services, even now, there were here on Dizengoff Center, there were over a thousand uh, people praying on Yom Kippur of all different uh, shades and styles. And there, there's wonderful programming going on here and an education and open uh, Bate Midrash study halls. So I, yeah, I, I, think I felt it too. Mm -hmm. when, when we live in a frat, yeah. you know, we're, in, we're in a little bubble. Mm -hmm. Everyone's doing it. And then you were in Tel Aviv, and I actually last year was in Caesarea, 
And uh, it's not a particularly religious place, but on Yom Kippur and on Rosh Hashanah, everyone comes out and there are no cars and people respect it. And people come for their certain times and they want to hear the shofar and they want to have that certain dimension of, uh, of Jewish flavor and culture. I think it's, it was so inspiring. Yeah, I agree. So I'm hopeful that we're moving in that direction. You know, uh, I, I certainly learned from my home uh, what I call Torah learned optimism. Uh, and, and I think we are moving forward in a very, a very positive direction. And I see a lot of rabbis like, like yourself, uh, you know, working on outreach. Look at what's happening in Poland. I mean, if we can, if we can now shift a little to Krakow. Ah, I wanted to mention that this afternoon at the beach, just whatever, an hour and a half ago, uh, I run into a student of mine who literally, uh, I'm coming out of the water. She's going in with a surfboard. I said, wow, so nice to see you. We recognized each other. Uh, so nice to see you. And uh, we spoke for a few minutes. And the first thing she said is, are you going to Poland this year? I'd like to go again. She's graduated, but she wants to go again. It was so meaningful. And the resurgence of Jewish life that you're involved in, in Poland, I, I think in general, there, there is this movement also happening in Israel, you know, to uh, identify more strongly with Jewish roots, first discovering Jewish roots as people do every day in, in Poland, uh, but also, strengthening that connection. I feel it happening, just like I feel it happening in Krakow, I also feel it happening in Israel. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think we, the, we need to, we need to, the, she asked a very important question though, which is about you coming to Poland. We'd love to, uh, to have wow. you here. I would Jewish love to take my students to Poland this year. I hope it's possible. I don't know is the coronavirus is evolving. Know. It's uh, you know. very stressful, I think. You know, yeah. how, how our lives are going to adapt to it's this to new it's reality. To, it's very hard to make plans further than, you know, a month or so. You can't really, the type of plans the type of uh, runway that you need to make plans with groups and schools and more organized way is very hard to do during this period. But we're still also a, a, Jacob's, a Jacob's risk in ride for the living uh, experience might be bringing the whole, I feel like whole family. There's lots of different, uh, lots of different members of the family that I've spoken to over the years about doing the bicycle ride in different ways. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm sure Eddie's up. Michael, Michael's done it already. So you're, you know, Michael B. So I think that it would be a, that would be nice. Team, team Jacobs Riskin. Be nice. We would love to join. We would love to join. Many of us would love to join. And I hope it will be possible by spring, summer of this year. You know, we, we will hopefully be able to, uh, push our, our acumen further and work on developing more, more uh, you know, vac vaccines for each of the variants that are developing. It's wow. very, very challenging. We're living in very challenging times. We are, we are. But I hope, I hope that we will be able to resume our travel and, uh, you know, those connections, which thank God for technology, we have been able to maintain connections and community and uh, education. And I'm very grateful to that. At the same time, it's, it's missing, you know, that that personal interaction is really missing. 
No question. Only only Avi travels all the time still. That's right. I seem to be doing it doing it more in this in these days. But um, Bacha, I want you to know, uh, and you do know the the influence. Uh, that your father has had on on me and uh, all of uh, our generation. Do you know? Do you know, however, <clears throat> that um, he was inspired by my grandfather? My grandfather was a rabbi in the '30s and uh, till the '60s, and your father used to go to hear my grandfather's speeches on on the high holidays. And he used to tell me that he always he used to tell me very fondly that that there was something very moving for him, and. I was obviously moved and inspired by my grandfather, but by also by your father. And now, and now I, I, I remember bringing my daughter to your father for a, uh, her bat mitzvah. And uh, it was so moving because, uh, you know, the generations keep on working off of the next one. And, and we wrote a book and we gave it to your father, to Rafa Riskin. And he was in shock because he usually gives out his farm to bat mitzvah girls. But, but uh, we actually, my daughter wrote one and gave it to her. And I, I hope that my daughter will be inspired by you in terms of being a rabbi in the next generation and being going forward to, uh, to continue to uh, influence Jewish life and to bring it, the halacha, as we say, to the next, uh, to the next dimension. So it's, it's, we're, we're intertwined, Bacha. Definitely. Avi, thank you so much for, for bringing that here to this, to this session here together because I know what an impact your grandfather had on my father and he he has spoken in fact more recently when we've we've been in touch with Holocaust Survivors Day and we spent that afternoon together with Eddie in Tel Aviv so when I reported back to my father about the program that day so he actually uh told me about that. He, he reminded me about the influence that your grandfather had on his life. You know, my father was raised in a non-religious home, but his grandmother was, was religious and actually taught him Talmud. His grandmother, her name was Batya, and I was named after Batya. Speaking of generations and inspiring your children, grandchildren, please God, great, great. So it does continue. And your grandfather had a community. My father would go and uh, hear his lectures and his classes, and they had tremendous impact. Amazing. The, uh... Galgal Chozer Olam, it keeps on going and we keep on, you know, uh, growing and evolving, uh, but holding on to our tradition. Pretty cool, huh? Amen. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. That's, that's our tradition. Rabbi Bacha, we have a couple more questions for you that we always ask uh, sort of toward the end. One, because we do this very, very important, very serious Latka Hamantash debate here every year in Krakow, which is the more perfect Jewish food. So I've got to ask you if you're on Team Latka or Team Hamantash. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. So whew, that's a hard one. <laughs> I much prefer baking hamantash, uh, but prefer eating latkes. Oh, that's <laughs> what a if there was ever a Talmudic answer that we had, <laughs> asked 70 people that question, that was the best answer we've gotten. <laughs> that was fantastic. Wow. What an answer. An original question. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> a record book of answers to that, that was question. The best answer. Fantastic. No, down. Drop the mic. Best answer we've had. Bacha, your three favorite films of all time. Oh my goodness, you didn't prepare me for this. <laughs> we want spontaneous Batya. The truth is I'm not such a uh, film a film watcher. Uh, most of the films that that I wind up watching are Shoah films. Um, oh. mm. I know what your father's favorite film is. 
Really? What's that? The Lion King. Really? Ah, I didn't man. know that. He, okay. Wow. He loves the Lion King. Talks about it a lot. He says a lot of Musser. There's a lot of Talmudic ideas, a lot of messages about life and death and responsibility and rejecting the idea of Akuna Matata. Oh, don't get me started, but that's for another uh, AMA. Wow. Okay, that's really interesting. I'm gonna move on because I've never really, uh, no, I, I always prefer, I always prefer romantic comedies to, uh, to anything else, but wind up watching the show up. <laughs> so that's why so you like Poland. I can't really name name off the bat. That's okay. Uh, yeah. that's okay. Your hum, lack of hamantash and answer is is uh, equal right. to to yeah, any. Yeah, it, it eclipses right. anything else. It does. It clearly does. And we'll take show off films as a category as the answer. Bata, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's always good. It's so good to see you and to talk to you and to reconnect. And we miss you here in Krakow and your family. And please to say hi to, to, to everyone for us and to, to Eddie and your father and mother and kids and just all the growing Jacobs uh, Riskin clan. And it's we... been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And Great warm talking. regards to Kasha Not as well. And and I wish I wish you both and whoever's listening a wonderful new year, much renewal, creativity, and healing for the world. Thank you so much. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everyone.